tissue oxygen monitor. This is a probe that is placed directly into the organs. I think probably the biggest benefit from this is into the brain. That's pretty much what they talk about in the book. But it's able to monitor tissue oxygenation once placed. The clinical indications here are monitor the brain tissue oxygen as an early sign of ischemia, assess brain blood flow autoregulation, and monitor the adequacy of brain perfusion in patients with traumatic brain injury. So here's a schematic of that tissue oxygen probe and you see that the normal value there is about 10 to 15 tor that is put through the skull and actually into the into the brain itself. And the next topic is oximetry. Whether this is being pulse oximetry or hemoximetry it kind of uses the same idea where it's from spectrophotometry and that works off of different patterns of light absorption for each substance, whether it's hemoglobin with oxygen on it, hemoglobin with carbon monoxide on it, empty hemoglobin, that's the way it works. It all absorbs light differently. So for example, oxyhemoglobin absorbs less red light and more infrared light. We have several types that we use. The co-oximetry or the hemoximetry. This is a laboratory analytical procedure requiring invasive sampling of arterial blood. And the idea there is the CO stands for carbon monoxide. And so we're trying to detect you know, the carbon monoxide level in the blood. Pulse oximetry is the non-invasive monitoring technique performed at bedside. You also have venous oximetry, which is an invasive monitoring through fiber optic catheter placed in the vena cava or pulmonary artery. And then the tissue oximetry, which this is a non-invasive method of measuring saturation of hemoglobin at the tissue level. Hemoximetry measures blood oxygen levels and hemoglobin saturations using a hemoximeter. Multiple lights pass through a sample to measure multiple hemoglobin species such as oxyhemoglobin and carboxyhemoglobin and methemoglobin. If you have good quality assurance measures, then the measurements are usually very accurate. And one thing about the carboxyhemoglobin is if you suspect carboxyhemoglobin or carbon monoxide poisoning, in the case of carbon monoxide poisoning, the pulse oximetry Although the reading would be accurate, it's going to mislead you into the, the treatment of the carbon monoxide poisoning patient. Because in carbon monoxide poisoning, the pulse oximeter will read artificially high. Although accurate, it will read high, but it's, it doesn't reflect the amount of hemoglobin that carbon monoxide is attached to. So in that instance, if you suspect carbon monoxide poisoning, you probably actually need to do a hemoximetry value. This is figure 18-17 on page 405. This is a simplified diagram showing key components of a laboratory hemoximeter. So you notice here that it has a beam splitter where it sends part of the beam to the reference sen sensor and then the other part goes through the curvette, the sample curvette. And so then it, from the curvette, then it runs through the sample sensor. So it compares these two values and comes up with a percentage of whatever you're trying to read, whether it's carbon monoxide or methemoglobin or whatever. Pulse oximetry combines the principles of spectrophotometry with photoplasmography. I think that's the longest word I know. Invasive portable monitoring device providing the estimates of saturation of oxygen and the results are reported as SpO2. So if, if you draw the arterial sample it's reported as SaO2. If you do it with a pulse oximeter it's reported as SpO2. Pulse oximeter uses the light absorption pattern to indicate the saturation levels of pulsed blood. So you have to have this light 
over a highly vascular area like underneath the fingernail and the earlobe in the nair somewhere like that and it has to have a pulse so if you don't have good circulation to your hand or even your, your arm even where you're placing the pulse oximeter then you're likely not going to get a an accurate reading this is an estimation right the values if you have to compare the values between the heme oximetry and the pulse oximetry you would rely on the heme oximetry as being the accurate one so, but they should be accurate within three to five percent of the heme oximetry and the finger probes are not reliable on patients with shock in other words if they're having blood pressure issues probably better to to use something else another issue is, is you can't distinguish between carboxyhemoglobin and oxyhemoglobin thus it reads falsely high in carbon monoxide poisoning so does not measure the CaO2 the arterial content or the PCO2 patients suspecting of having O2 transport issues or hypoventilation should have an ABG done there's actually two types of sensors one of the sensors has two sides and the light shines through the organ if it's if it's the fingernail the tip of the finger it has to shine all the way through the finger if it's across the earlobe if it's on the toe if it's on the hand like a child in the nursery one side has a red and infrared light the other side is the detector as it shines through then it it splits the beam or, or it actually now has one of these lights as a reference light and the other one is a is the sensor light and re more recently they've come out with what they call a reflectance sensor this is the one that you see around the forehead sensor only on one side containing these light sources and photo detectors and the sensor is placed on the skin surfaces usually the forehead and it looks something like this where you have a light emittance in one area and then a detector in another where the reflection off of the bone occurs and that that's where the detector senses the light and so remember that pulse oximetry actually needs a pulse so it can compare the two values uh, you just you simply won't get a venous value if you're doing pulse oximetry but you have to have a pulse there so if your your perfusion is compromised then you don't get an accurate reading I want to read to you here the rule of thumb on page 407 when using a pulse oximeter to warn of hypoxemia in an otherwise healthy adult never set the low alarm below 92 percent generally this level ensures that the alarm is activated before the true arterial saturation drops below their critical value of 90 percent I know a lot of patients that especially if they're having to wear these things at night and every time they turn over this thing goes off and wakes them up so they you know they'll go in and turn this down real low or turn the alarm off so that it doesn't disturb the patient but in reality if if there if a problem arises by the time you're called in there then you have a very sick patient you have a very critical situation whereas if it calls you in there at 92 you still got a little time to get on top of things and the patient doesn't get in distress venous oximetry assesses the balance between oxygen delivery and utilization as an indirect index of global tissue oxygenation and perfusion so normal values for mixed venous via the pulmonary artery oxygen saturation monitoring or the SVO2 is a range from 60 to 80 percent with an average being probably around 75 and so you'll see this with the swan gans catheters you know you don't see this on everybody but if you have this this catheter in place then utilize and compare the arterial to venous values to make sure they're reasonable the tissue oximetry oxygen saturation at the tissue level or the STO2 assesses adequacy of circulation and oxygen delivery early detection of low STO2 can be used as an early detection method of tissue hypoperfusion in patients with traumatic injuries 
like a traumatic brain injury. Capnometry measures the carbon dioxide and the exhaled gases. The capnometer measures the levels. Capnography is the graphic display of carbon dioxide levels as they change during breathing, most often used in patients undergoing general anesthesia or mechanical ventilation. And again, you use the infrared light absorption to get this accomplished. You have a mainstream technique places an analysis chamber at the patient's breathing circuit and a slide stream technique pump, which pumps small volumes of gas from the circuit into a nearby analyzer. And here's an example of each of those. The one that we see is the one on the left here where you actually have a sensor connected onto the circuit. So you have to have a curvette and then a sensor shines the light through the windows of the curvette and comes up with a value. The other on the right hand side here is where there's actually some gases removed from the ex well, during exhalation and actually measures the CO2 level there. The normal capnogram has three phases, phase one, phase two, and phase three. Phase one is um, the zero, the start of the expiratory breath. In other words, you don't have, you have very little exhaled carbon dioxide in the trachea, and that's what comes out first, is in your large airways. And soon afterwards, the PCO2 level rises sharply and plateaus as the alveolar gas is exhaled and that represents phase two and phase three. Then you have the end tidal CO2 level or what we refer to as PET CO2. This is used to estimate dead space ventilation and normally averages three to five millimeters of mercury less than the arterial tension of carbon dioxide. So here's your capnogram with CO2 level along the vertical axis and time being along the horizontal axis. And so you see you have the A, B, and C areas there where you have the plateau. Well, this is phase one, the beginning of the breath. Phase two is where you transition to the alveolar gases. And then the plateau or phase three here is actually where you're emptying the alveolar gas. And then right here at this corner is what we refer to as the end tidal CO2 level. And that's, that's what will be displayed as your end tidal CO2. So working with these waves, uh, just because they have different types of waveforms doesn't mean that you're capnometry is m malfunctioning it, it's likely that the patient is has changes going on rather than the equipment so here you see the purple line represents a normal capnogram and so if you have things going on within the lungs that changes your value of exhaled co2 then you have changes in the waveform itself. So this one actually represents a VQ mismatch or left heart failure or COPD, something like that. 